All right, open your Bible with me to Acts chapter 7. Tonight we start a new chapter, and it is one of the longest chapters, if not the longest chapter, uh, in the book of Acts. However, (laughs) I'm going to bite off 53 verses of it tonight, and let's see how far we can get. Acts chapter 7. Tonight we're looking at verses 1 through 53 in a sermon entitled, Stephen's Defense. And there's a lot of things um, that are going to obviously come up as we look at a text that is so broad and so lengthy. Um, It is important that you have your Bible in front of you tonight in order that we can um, cover large sections of this at a time um, so that we can get through and uh, see kind of the overarching narrative because Stephen's defense is not one that needs to be nitpicked or um, looked at under a microscope, but rather it is a meta narrative of scripture. He tells the story of scripture in his sermon. Really, it's not even a sermon. It is his recitation and retelling of scripture under the lens of the context of these questions that are being asked of him by the Pharisees. And so some things that we're going to look at as we go through here um, is first we recognize where Stephen is. Uh, We remember that in Acts chapter 6, we have the deacon office is established, and it is through this that Stephen comes to this office, and it was while he's in this office as a man of great faith uh, that he begins to do these wonderful acts of the Holy Spirit, much like Peter and the other apostles. And it's during these things that as he witnesses and these signs come forth from him uh, to the people that now he finds himself in the same hot water that the apostles are in, and he finds himself before the Sanhedrin, and this is his audience. And so one thing before we even get started that we can recognize as we go through Stephen's defense is that he's speaking to a specific audience, and he's going to speak to that audience out of the knowledge that he has as a Hellenistic Jew of the Old Testament. And so I think one apologetic takeaway that we can take away before we even get started is when we have these conversations of defending the faith, it ought to be very important to us to recognize who our audience is. Unlike Stephen, our audience likely is not going to be a Jewish type of audience. Uh, That is typically not what we encounter in our context here in America. Instead, our audience, when we give a defense for our faith and we we tell people about Jesus, typically our audience is non-believing. Our audience is maybe believing, but of the world to such an extent that you can't even tell any inkling of fruits of Christianity from them. Uh, It might be a person who is staunched in a cult or a movement of the world. Uh, Many people today with this mentality of uh, you can take a lot of things from a bunch of different religions and put them all in a bucket. That's that's their religion. Um, So you might have different audiences, and it's important to recognize to whom you speak. And so Stephen does a great job, and we're going to see that as he walks through this, that he speaks to the Old Testament Jews that he speaks to, And he lays the Old Testament out before them and affirms all of these things that are truths, but then builds Jesus on top of that. But we're also going to recognize as we go through this that Stephen is not the final character of the book of Acts. Stephen will give way in chapter 8 to Philip, but neither of these two deacons are the ones who is the main purpose. This is all foreshadowing to the main character who comes in chapter 9, and we'll see briefly at the end of chapter 7, that is Saul of Tarsus, or Paul the Apostle. And so Paul's ministry, as he gets started in chapter 9, and all the way through Acts and throughout his letters, is an apologetic ministry. That word apologetic means to give a defense. His ministry goes out giving a defense. In fact, in uh, Philippians chapter 1, as he's giving his long intro there, and we have that beautiful verse that uh, we, we, we pray that the hope that has started in us will come to completion in the day of Jesus Christ. Uh, I believe it's Philippians chapter 1, verse 7. Right before that, I believe it's in verse 6, Paul talks of the ministry of defending the faith. And so it's one that's very important for Paul in his ministry. But we're going to see that before Paul was even a Christian, here is Stephen doing the very apologetic ministry that Paul will then do. Here is the person who taught Paul how to be a good Christian. And it is a martyr who Paul himself, as Saul, will kill. 
We also recognize that um, Stephen's apologetic is going to prophesy and foreshadow Paul's own life. And so at every juncture of his argument, we're going to stop and we're going to look and we're going to say, wait a minute, Paul is listening to this. And this likely affects the way that he views Jesus as the Christ. Maybe not yet, but on the other side of that road. And so as we look at all those things, we're also going to look at how he uh, looks at Scripture. Stephen is not going to look at Scripture um, as something that is, maybe I have to require it in my sermon, but he's going to use it as something that is recited, that is important. And above anything that he would have to say, the Scripture is the forefront of all these things. And so Stephen's going to tell this meta narrative of scripture. And so as we read through it, we're going to get the big picture of what Stephen believes about the Old Testament. And actually, it's just a retelling of the Old Testament. There's no opinion much in it. And we're going to see how he uses that to say, here's what God was doing in this time. Here's how it affects us now. And here's how it has an application even now. And so let's start um, in chapter six of Acts. We might remember that Stephen was accused of several different things. Beginning in Acts chapter 6, verse 11, looking back at last week, we have the first things that are accused of Stephen. Acts 6, 11, then they secretly induced men to say, and here's the first two accusations against Stephen. We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And so the way that Stephen is going to argue in chapter 7, he's going to first argue an apologetic of God. You accuse me of blaspheming God, let me tell you who I believe God to be. And you're going to see that you agree with me on all these things. And so he's going to build a case that he is not blaspheming God. Then he's going to move from that. He's going to take the second charge that you've spoken blasphemous words against Moses. They're inverted in verse 11, but he argues them, the most important God, on then to arguing for a belief in the supremacy of the leadership of Moses, that first lawgiver and the greatest teacher in the Pharisaic mind. And so he's going to move and he's going to build his argument on these two fronts. And then he'll move on to some very specific complaints that we see in Acts chapter 6. Go down to Acts chapter 6, verse 13. We get two more things that they charge against Stephen. When they pull him forward and they have the false witnesses, they put forward false witnesses, verse 13, who said, this man incessantly speaks against this holy place. What holy place? The temple and the law. So after he moves on from Moses, his argument is going to transform and he's going to look at the temple and how important worship is. And he's going to give us an apologetic, a defense of worship. And then finally, he's going to move on. And his last, it's like two verses. He gives us an apologetic of the law, but it looks at those who he speaks to. And so he gives this condemnation against the Pharisees. And this is what spurs in his apologetic of the law, them, self-righteous as they are, stoning him in the very last uh, parts of chapter 7. And so this is the apologetic that's laid out as he is going to have to give a defense for himself. Verse 1 of chapter 7 opens up this way. The high priest said, in response to everything that's accused of him in chapter 6, that he spoke blasphemous words against God, that he spoke blasphemous words against Moses, that he spoke against the temple and he spoke against the law, the priest says, are these things so? Here's your opportunity. The witnesses have spoken. Now you get your opportunity to say what's next. And now verses 2 through 53 are all going to be about what is your response? Are these things so or are they not? And some of them are going to find that he does, to a certain degree, espouse such beliefs, but not in the way that the false witnesses bring them up to him. And so we begin in verse 2. And he said, that is Stephen. Everything else is by him. He's going to speak. If this, if we had red letters for Christ and blue letters for Stephen, the rest of the chapter is blue letters all the way down until verse 54. Stephen speaks. Hear me, brethren. Ooh, the first thing he does, here's something important. The world is not our enemy. The atheist is not our enemy. Ephesians chapter 6 tells us who the enemy is. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6, our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against 
principalities and dominions and things in heavenly places. It's satanic, the things that are our enemy. People are not our enemy. And the first thing that Stephen does right is he levels with them, not as friend and foe, not as opponent and enemy, but as brethren. He levels with them as collectively here, they're brothers in faith. They believe in the same God. You are Jews. I'm a Hellenistic Jew, but the difference is I believe in Jesus Christ. Brethren. And then he gives them respect. He doesn't just light into them. He doesn't have the same authority as Jesus who's dealt with these Pharisees and calls them broods of vipers. There's a time for that. And it'll come at the end. But first, he levels with them in respect to see what they're going to do. Fathers, brethren, and fathers, fathers of the faith, important people, respected individuals. Hear me, brethren and fathers. What do I believe? The God of glory. This is an important phrase, the God of glory, because it only appears in one place in the entire Old Testament. Of all the names of God that you might find in the Old Testament, God the Father. The um, Jesus calls himself the Son of Man. You, you might find all sorts of the Lord, the Lord God, the Lord God Almighty. You have all sorts of names for God, but God of glory is one that only appears in one location. And as soon as he says this, he doesn't have to explain what he believes about God because there's a psalm that's explaining it for him. As soon as he says this title, they know what God he speaks of. Would you flip with me to Psalm chapter 29? In Psalm chapter 29 is the one usage of this term, God of glory. And so as soon as he uses the term, the Pharisees, likely because they've memorized large parts of Scripture, definitely all of the Torah, and likely some of the Psalms as well, they're going to recognize that this is the name of God in Psalm 29 aptly titled, maybe for such a time as what Stephen now stands in, this is the voice of the Lord in the storm. Psalm 29, a psalm of David. I'm reading a Psalm 29, it's 11 verses. Ascribe to the Lord, O sons of the mighty, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory do his name. Worship the Lord in holy array. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord is over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. Yes, the Lord breaks in pieces the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon skip like a calf and Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord hews out flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer to calve and strips the forest bare. And in his temple, everything says glory. The Lord sat as king at the flood. Yes, the Lord sits as king forever. The Lord will give strength to his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. Who is the Lord of glory? Who is the God of glory that Stephen speaks of in, so in Acts chapter 7, verse 2? The God of glory, the Lord of glory, is none other than the creating God, who is powerful over all creation, that by his very voice, the strongest cedars known to the ancient Near East burst at his voice, who has complete control over all of his creation, who in the latter verses of Psalm 29 is the king of all things. So when he speaks of the God of glory, all of Psalm 29 rushes forth in their memory. This is the God I believe in. Automatically, get out of your mind that I am blaspheming against God. My apologetic of God is that God is the one who should receive all glory. In fact, what did Jesus say he came to do? But he came to ensure the Father's glory. We spoke on it on 1 Corinthians chapter 15 on this last Sunday when we looked at his coming. And so Jesus is speaking of the very same God of glory. It's even saying they're not different. Just understand who Jesus is. And now he continues, who is this God of glory referenced 
in response to the Jews that stand before him. He traces it all the way back to their greatest forefather, the Pharisees believe, Abraham. The God of glory, verse 2 continues, appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he, he lived in Haran. I believe in the same God who started Judaism. The same God who is the fathers of our Jewish faith. He ties it back to the roots of Judaism. He continues in verse 3, What did this God of glory do? He said to him, Abraham, leave your country and your relatives. This is a quotation from the Old Testament. And come into the land that I will show you. Then he left the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. From there, after his father died, God had him move to this country in which you are now living. But he gave him no inheritance in it, not even a foot of ground. And yet, even when he had no child, he promised that he would give it to him as a, as a possession and to his descendants after him. This is not just the God of the Old Testament. This is not just the God of the fathers, but this is a God that I believe in who demands crazy faith. A faith so strong that it would call Abraham to leave his family and to trust in a promise that though he has no children, he's going to give him the very land he travels to, to children he doesn't have. This is a God of crazy faith. And he's leveling with the Jews here. This is the same God you serve. And it's out of this crazy faith that God makes a promise. In verses 5 through 8, catalog the promise. We've already read verse 5, but we pick up in the middle. It says, he promised that he would give it to him as a possession and to his descendants after him. And he seals that promise, verses 6, six through 8. But God spoke to this effect, that his descendants would be aliens in a foreign land, they would be enslaved and mistreated for 400 years. And whatever nation to which they will be in bondage, I myself will judge, said God. And after that, they will come out and serve me in this place. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham became the father of Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac became the father of Jacob and Jacob of the 12 patriarchs. This is the God of the promise. And he is looking back at all of this that's happened and saying, this is the God I serve. The one who's made a promise to you and he has kept it. Whose covenant of circumcision you still bear as Jews. And he's calling on all of these things in their memory. And so he builds up these patriarchs, Abraham first, and then Isaac, and then Jacob, and then Verse 8 ends with, and the 12 patriarchs. He builds up the most important people of the Jewish faith. Because everybody in Jesus' time, they knew what tribe they were of. Of the 12 patriarchs, you traced your lineage back to one of those. And then from there, to Jacob, who is Israel, the national name. We live in Israel. And then, to Isaac and Abraham. And so, Stephen is saying, I affirm all of these things. I can tell you where I'm lumped into all of this. I can tell you where, as part of the diaspora, that I come in as a Hellenistic Jew. I can tell you all of the ways that I believe these things. But the problem is that these people that they hold so high as the most respected people in their faith were not all good people. And so to speak blasphemous things about God, well, watch what the patriarchs do. Verse 9, the patriarchs, the fathers, the important people, did they not speak blasphemous things? Did they not rebel against God? Became jealous of Joseph and sold him into Egypt, yet God was with him. Stephen's going ahead and he's making the distinction. What you charge me of, I'm not the first to be charged of this. The very patriarchs that you uphold, they rebelled against God. They rebelled against his person who he was with, yet God was with him, verse 9, Joseph. And he goes on to paint, who else is God? Not just the God of his forefathers, but verse 10, he's the rescuer God and rescued him from all his afflictions, granted him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and made him governor over Egypt and all his household. Now a famine came over all Egypt and Canaan, 
and great affliction with it, and our fathers could not find food. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent our fathers there the first time. On the second time, Joseph made himself known to his brothers, and Joseph's family was disclosed to Pharaoh. Then Joseph sent word and invited Jacob, his father, and all his relatives to come to him, 75 persons in all. And Jacob went down to Egypt, and there he and our fathers died. This is the God who rescues his people. He rescues Joseph from his family's clutches who are rebelling against God and against Joseph. He rescues Joseph from the clutches of all of this misery to elevated position in Egypt. He rescues Egypt from the famine. He rescues all the surrounding areas. He even rescues, to turn the story all the way back around and make it full circle, he even rescues the very people, the patriarchs, who rebelled against God all the way back in verse 9. He does all this. He's the God of rescuing. And he's the God who's faithful to the end because even after death, verse 16, God has a resting place for them. From there, verse 16, they were removed to Shechem and laid in the tomb which Abraham had purchased for a sum of money from the sons of Hamor in Shechem. Stephen appeals to who they know God to be in order to show the validity of the Christian movement. This Christian movement that Stephen stands with is not disconnected from the Old Testament, but is founded on the same belief of who God is and what their history is. The same promise that was given to Abraham is the same promise that is fulfilled in Jesus. The same God who rescues Joseph and his people from the clutches of all of the wicked things that were happening during this famine is the same God who rescued his people in Jesus. The same Christian movement has the same Hebrew roots, and he appeals to this background. And here Paul is. We know he's there because at the end of Acts 7, he appears. He's been listening to all of this. Here Paul is, a staunch Jew. He tells us in his letters of how Jewish he was. I'm a Jew above all Jews. And as staunchly Jewish as Paul is, he is against the Christian movement. But here he hears Stephen speaking of all the things that Jewish belief is built on. It gives this foundation for which to jump from Judaism to Christianity. Paul is going to arise Christian out of a staunchly Jewish background to the point that he would be the least likely convert. Yet none can deny that the God of the Christians is the same God who began the Jewish religion. And so here he builds this foundation. And for us, an application here, how can we argue the same way that Stephen does? We build a foundation between the person we're trying to convey the message of Christ to and the message of Christ that we can jump from the common ground to the things on which we disagree. And here he's built this common ground, the Jewishness of the Christian faith, in order to now go on. I've defended who I believe God to be. He's the same person you believe him to be. But now let's move on to Moses. And in verses 17 through 43, a very long time, he's going to look at Moses. And there's a need here for Christianity to be tied to the larger religious teachings of Judaism. There's going to be a Christian movement known as Marcionism, that is a heretical movement of the early church that detaches Christianity from the Old Testament. Marcion will arise in a few hundred years after this conversation, and he'll say the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament are different gods. The Old Testament is not the same as the New Testament. In fact, this is a wicked and evil God of the Old Testament, and this is a good and gracious God in the New Testament. He will go so far as to be one of the greatest anti-Semites of his time, and maybe ever, because he hates Jews and he hates the God they serve. And he sees this as not a common ground, but as a fighting between Jews and Christians. Stephen does not see it as so. And he needs to let his people that he's talking to, the Jewish brothers and fathers who stand before him, know, I'm not here to attack your God. In fact, I believe in the same one. More than this, I believe in the teachings of the one that you would hold the most dear, Moses. And so he goes on to attack the second complaint. Firstly, they complained, you spoke blasphemous things against God. Now, number two, 
You spoke blasphemous things against Moses. So now he takes on Moses. Verse 17. After all the patriarchs, what happened to the promise? Verse 17. But at the time of the promise, as the time of the promise was approaching, which God had assured to Abraham, the people increased and multiplied in Egypt until there arose another king over Egypt who knew nothing about Joseph. It was he who took shrewd advantage of our race, mistreated our fathers so that they would expose their infants and they would not survive. It was at this time that Moses was born. He was lovely in the sight of God and he was nurtured three months in his father's home. And so here, Stephen is showing how the Moses, who they say he's blaspheming against, was one who was appointed by God as a leader, raised up at such a time that his promise, that's how he starts it in verse 17, that it's the promise that Moses has come to fulfill. And here, we can see where Stephen's going, can't we? Just as Moses was raised up to fulfill the promises of God in his day, What's the logical conclusion? What day do we live in? In Stephen's day, in the day of the Sanhedrin. But Jesus has arose, a leader, to fulfill the promises of God at his due time. In fact, it's one of my favorite uh, verses from Galatians. It's there in Galatians chapter 5. And it says, at just the right time, God sent Jesus Christ, born of a virgin. It is at this appointed time that he's been sent. It's very similar to what Stephen says here about Moses. And so he, he raises up his people to um, fulfill his promise, but it also occurs in this time of difficulty that we just launched out of in the Joseph narrative. But then we have another thing that is very similar about Moses and that the people who stand before him would not disagree with. Continue on in verse 21. Though Moses is born to fulfill the promise of God, though Moses is to be the leader, verse 21, and after he had been sent outside, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and nurtured him as his own son. Moses was educated in all the learning of the Egyptians, and he was a man of power in words and deeds. We get his background astute in all these things. He's qualified to be a leader in Stephen's eyes and in the Jews' eyes. But, verse 23, but when he was approaching the age of 40, it entered his mind to visit the brethren, the sons of Israel. And when he saw one of them being treated unjustly, look how, he, look how Stephen uses this here. He defended him and took vengeance for the oppressed by striking down the Egyptian. Stephen's understanding of what Moses did when he murders the man in the desert, he's putting a polite spin on this. He is going so far to esteem Moses that he's even looking at this event and he's saying this was a, was a, was a good thing that he did. This was him taking the, the righteous anger of God out on this Egyptian. He goes so far as in verse 25, he says this, and he supposed that his brother, brethren understood that God was granting them deliverance through him. But they did not understand. What happens? Well, he continues in verse 26, On the following day, he appeared to them as they were in fighting together, and he tried to reconcile them in peace, saying, Men, you're brethren. Why do you injure one another? But the one who was injuring his neighbor pushed him aside, saying, who made you a ruler and a judge over us? You do not mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday, do you? And at this remark, Moses fled, became an alien in the land of Midian, where he became the father of two sons. Stephen is painting it this way for a reason. And let's not read too far into Stephen's assessment here. I don't think Stephen means to say whether or not Moses killing the Egyptian was a good or bad thing. I don't think that's the point. I think the point is to point back to Jesus. Because Moses here is portrayed as Stephen, as someone who has ar arisen as a leader for the Hebrews, but what did they do? They didn't recognize him. John chapter 1, how does it begin? And he was sent to his own, but his own did not know him. Jesus is the very one who is 
sent by God at the perfect time, raised up as a leader in order that he might win not only the Hebrews, but even the whole world to himself. And the very people he came to save did not recognize him, not even his own people, the Israelites. Do you see the comparison here between Moses and Christ? And Stephen doesn't have to say it. The context of the moment speaks for itself. Why is he on trial? It is not because he blasphemed against God. It is not because he blasphemed against Moses. It's not because he said the temple was going to fall down. It's not because he blasphemed against the law. The real reason Stephen's in here is none of these things. Because Stephen did not walk out after he was elected deacon and start saying, this temple's going down. He didn't start saying, give me the Ten Commandments and I'm going to stomp on them. That is not what Stephen said. Stephen went out there and he preached the name of Jesus. And as a result, they said, let's look for all the little things we can get him on. And so, yes, he's defending the little things they're getting him on, but he's pointing to Jesus all the while as he does it. And here in the story of Moses, he says, yes, I believe in Moses, but don't you see the similarities to one who you don't believe in? He continues and he gives Moses high praise And we see more things that are similar. I'm going to read about 13 verses. It's going to be a little while because this is the big narrative. This is the big picture of what happens, not little things. Starting in verse 30, he says this about Moses. After 40 years had passed, that is Moses living in the wilderness, an angel appeared to him in the the wilderness of Mount Sinai in the flame of a burning thorn bush. When Moses saw it, he marveled at the sight. And as he approached to look more closely, there came the voice of the Lord. I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Moses shook with fear and would not venture to look. But the Lord said to him, take off the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt and have heard their groans and have come down to rescue them. Come now and I will send you to Egypt. This Moses, whom they disowned, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge, is the one whom God sent to be both a ruler and a deliverer with the help of the angel who appeared to him in the thorn bush. Look at how Stephen strengthens the case. In verse 35, he shows it is not just because of the event in Egypt, but even in Midian, God appeared to him and said, This is the one I want to lead out. It's not just because of Jesus' time. It's not just because of the prophecies. Now what is Stephen appealing to? It is the very audible voice of God at his baptism. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. He's appealing to Moses' own calling as similar to that of Christ. Why do you believe in one but not the other? He continues in verse 36. This man led them out, that is, of Egypt, performing wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness for 40 years. This is the Moses who said to the sons of Israel, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. This is the one who is in the congregation in the wilderness together with the angel who is speaking to him on Mount Sinai and who was with our fathers and he received living oracles to pass on to you. The Moses that you say I blaspheme, this is the Moses I preach of. The Moses who was raised up by God, who was called even in an angelic vision where he stood face to face with the presence of God, who did all of these miraculous things, namely miraculous things that are close to what is happening today, the signs and wonders of the apostles. How can you accept his signs, but you can't accept mine? He draws all the parallels without saying a word. The context speaks for itself. He recognizes they all know what he's talking about. But this Moses, who is called of God, was not recognized as one who was called of God. He now switches it, and he looks at the ugly side of what happened to Moses. Verse 39 of Acts 7, Our fathers were unwilling to be obedient to him, but repudiated him and in their hearts 
turned back to Egypt, saying to Aaron, Make for us gods who will go before us. For this Moses who led us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what happened to him. At that time, they made a calf and brought a sacrifice to the idol and were rejoicing in the works of their hands. Verse 42, But God turned away, delivered them up to serve the host of heaven, as it is written in the books of the prophets. It was not to me that you offered victims and sacrifices 40 years in the wilderness, was it, O house of Israel? Moses might have been called by God, and all the Jews say yes and amen. Moses might have had the angelic vision. He might have had all the signs and wonders that accompany it. And all the Jews say yes and amen. But the context is starking how how much it resembles what's currently happening. What is currently happening? Moses was hated in his day. Moses was rejected in his day. Moses was not received as a prophet in his day. And in the day of Stephen, Jesus was hated. He was crucified on the criminal's cross. He was rejected. He was despised. Do you see the resemblance? Stephen is saying, the very same Moses, you say I'm blaspheming? Look in the mirror and see who you're blaspheming. One is greater than Moses, and his name is Jesus. He gives an apologetic for God. He gives an apologetic for Moses, and now he tackles the last two specific claims. Firstly, an apologetic of worship. Our fathers, excuse me, back up to verse 43. Verse 43. You also took along the tabernacle of Molech and the star of the god of Rampha, the images which you made to worship. I also remove you beyond Babylon. So he begins this one backwards. Jumping off from the disobedience of the people in Moses' day, what did they take with them in the wilderness? Not only was it this idolatry, but they took with them the tabernacles, the modes of worship, the places of worship for these types of idols that they would worship. And so here he's looking first at their tabernacles, and now he turns in verse 44 to the real tabernacle of worship. Our fathers had the tabernacle of testimony in the wilderness, just as he who spoke to Moses directed him to make it according to the pattern which he has seen. And having received it in their turn, our fathers brought it in with Joshua upon dispossessing the nations whom God drove out before our fathers until the time of David. Their argument is, you're against the temple. And Stephen says, The temple has not always been. First, God demanded worship. As his people were mobile, he demanded a type of mobile worship. And the tabernacle, this moving type of temple, this extraordinary set of tents, that wherever they would go, they would take it with them. This is how he demanded worship, in this building, in this location. And then, Stephen goes through a history of worship. He turns from the tabernacle to... Verse 46, the temple. David, verse 46, found favor in God's sight and asked that he might find a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who built a house over him, a house for him. And so here he outlines, and it's not said the word temple, but it's assumed with the words David and Solomon in the building which Solomon built. But what are they talking about? They're talking about the temple. And so here's the time where they use the tabernacle. Here's the time where they use the temple. And then they're very familiar with the fact that the temple that they're currently in is not the one that Solomon built, but it is the second one that was built after they returned from the exile. And so here's three different modes of worship. So if you're going to call me blaspheming against the temple, speaking ill of the temple, you might want to recognize that that's not always how God has demanded worship. The thing that has stayed steady, though, is what? Verse 48. However. If we want to talk about worship, the Most High does not dwell in houses made by human hands. As the prophet said, heaven is my throne, earth is the footstool of my feet. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what place is there for my repose? Was it not my hand which made all these things? God's dominion has never been linked to a singular place. And so to say I'm speaking against the temple, no, 
God has something different for his people in this day. And Stephen is doing something extraordinary here because not only is, is he speaking on behalf of Christians then, but he's speaking on behalf of Christians who will come. You have to remember what is the church currently? The church currently meets in the temple. Yes, they do go from house to house breaking bread and doing their own Christian gatherings, but they're still in Jerusalem. They're still meeting at the temple. That's why the apostles every day are in the temple gathering, both to worship and to witness. But who is listening? Paul. And what's Paul going to do? He is the singular apostle who takes Christianity and moves it outside of Jerusalem. Philip is going to go on a mission. There's going to be other people who go on mission, but the chief apostle of missions is in the room listening to this. He doesn't know he's called by God yet, but he is going to go to Corinth and he's going to go to Ephesus and he's going to go to Philippi and he's going to go to Colossae and he's going to go to every surrounding area. He's going to go so far as some believe he even went to Spain. He went so far. And he's going to build a church there and start a group of Christians because God does not have to be worshipped in a house built by human hands. As he said to the woman at the well, woman, there's a day coming where it won't be this mountain or that mountain, but it will be in the hearts of believers as they worship God in spirit and in truth. And finally, in the last four verses, He's addressed an apologetic of God. He's addressed an apologetic of Moses. He's addressed an apologetic of worship. And the last thing they say against him, Stephen, you don't believe in the law. You want to get rid of the law. And this is the final blow he deals in just three short verses, both to the spirituality of the Pharisees and of his own life. Verse 51 he turns the tables. You men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. You're doing just like your fathers did. Everything he said about Abraham and about Moses and about those in those days, he now, if you didn't catch it before, you're doing the exact same thing that your fathers did. And namely, it is being stiff-necked, uncircumcised in heart and ears, and resisting the Holy Spirit. Remember, this is an address, as his argument is laid out, the only thing he hasn't addressed is the law. And Stephen is saying, the law which you hold so dear, you might be able to follow it in letter, but you don't follow it in heart. The law is something that's followed in conscience, in heart, in, in soul, in Holy Spirit. You can follow it by the letter, but you're not following it by the true intention. And in, because of it, you are the same as the fathers who would deny Moses and deny Abraham. It's not by tradition that we follow the law. It is not by necessarily the, the, the word by word, the, the dot by dot, but it is the intentions of the law. Jesus said it best, I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. There's a way in which Jesus looks at it. Jesus looks at the very law and he says, you've heard it said, and he takes it up a notch because what was said was not enough. You didn't get it the first time. Let me give you a new course on it. That murder, thou shalt not kill. You can find all sorts of loopholes here. Let me boil it down for you. When you hate somebody in your heart, you've sinned against God. When you say you fool, you have condemned them to hell and yourself with it. Jesus ups the ante. Stephen says, you may say, I don't follow the law, but take a look in the mirror. You don't follow it either. In fact, verse 52, which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? He's now looked at Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy. Now he looks at the whole of the prophets. You want to talk about your fathers and how important they are. Look at every prophet that God sent. Jesus said it too. From Kings, Chronicles, from these first prophets, all the way to the very last one in Malachi. Every single one of them were persecuted by God's own people. The blood of these prophets were on the hands of the fathers, of the Hebrews, of the Israelites. Which one of your fathers 
did these, uh, which one of these prophets did your fathers not persecute? Verse 52, they killed those who had previously announced the coming of the righteous one, whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. The very prophets who foretold of Jesus, you're the ones who did what your father started. Your fathers murdered the ones who foretold Jesus. And now you've seen Jesus and you've murdered him. He's condemning them very staunchly of the same exact thing that their father has done. Something is wrong with wicked men doing wicked things to silence those who speak out against them. And here it is the exact same way as it happened in the Old Testament. And the final blow, if they want to condemn me against the law, verse 53, you who receive the law as ordained by angels. They take the law as something that is as high as angels. It is something that is untouchable. It is the most important thing. You revere the law as the most important thing, verse 53 says, and yet you do not keep it. Does that not sound like Paul? And he stands in the corner, the one who has followed all the laws by his own Jewish mentality. And he is one of many who is hit by this condemnation. You yourself cannot follow the law. Stephen takes the law, and as Paul will do for every believer hereafter, turns it on them like a mirror and says, look at it. You're telling me you keep the law? You're telling me you've never lusted? You've never had greed? You've never committed adultery? You've never been angry enough to murder? You've never fill in the blank? It's the tactic that our apologetic has to end in, in offense. That we might build common ground, that we might preach the way to Jesus, but at the end we have to, conv- we have to confront the sinner with the ugly reality that as perfect as they think they are, they're in sin and desperately need a Savior. And this is what Stephen does, his final words. He, convert- he confronts them with this truth, repent. He doesn't even have to say it. Repent, you're in sin. Trust in Jesus Christ. Stephen shows that the Pharisees accuse him of breaking this Mosaic law, but at the end of the day, it's they themselves who've broken the greater law of God, a greater law of conscience and soul and spirit. Greater than letter, it's the intent of the law that they've broken. And more than that, they've killed the very lawgiver, not Moses, but Jesus himself. And Paul will go on to recognize that it is he who knew the law inside and out, and yet was still the one who broke it. And he'll teach that in his conversion to Christianity. As we look over, can we even call it a sermon? Stephen's retelling of Scripture. The condemnation for those who are in the room is severe. But the same can be said of us this evening that we hold fast to an Abrahamic tradition, that we hold fast to Moses who's delivered the law, that we hold fast that this sanctuary, this church is an important place of worship. We have an apologetic of gathering together and it's important. But above all these other things, we have to recognize, as these Pharisees are having a hard time doing, that when confronted with what we believe about God, what we believe about the traditions, what we believe about church, what we believe about all these things, When we take a good look at morality, we find that we have fallen short. And the only one who can help us is the one who Stephen proclaims. That is Jesus, who was crucified for our sins. But it did not end there. He was resurrected to new life. That all who would believe and trust in him would not perish, but have the same eternal life that he was resurrected into. And the truth is, folks, he's coming again. Trust in this Jesus before it's too late. Would you bow with me? Father, we thank you for your word. And we thank you that a man as young in the faith as Stephen is able to see your glory written on every page. Lord, we thank you for the witness of Stephen and the example he sets for those who, as we've been called to strive to share the good news of Jesus with the world. Lord, I pray that we would be as bold that we would be as faithful, that we would be as acknowledging of your Holy Spirit presence in our lives as Stephen was. 
Lord, I pray, holding fast to the words of Jesus, that in the day that we speak and are dragged before councils for your name's sake, that we should not fear, not worry about what we say in that moment, but that you are with us. Lord, help us to remember that promise as we do your good work and we speak the name of Jesus wherever we go. Lord, I pray as we go out from the rest of uh, this day into the rest of our week that we might take the name of Jesus with us and that you would give us people in order that we might share Jesus with. Lord, I pray asking that you would help us to recognize all of your attributes and your characteristics and who you are, God, as Stephen has, that as we leave from here, you might be forever on our minds and in everything that we do, that we might give you all the glory and the honor and the praise. Lord, we thank you for this moment together, and we ask that you bring us back safely again on Sunday. And we ask all of these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen.